Warm greens to everyone. I am Brooks Barrett, the Minister for Environmental Justice for the United Church of Christ. Glad to have everyone here for today's Creation Justice webinar, the webinar where we engage some of the most pressing matters faced by those seeking to be in the right relationship with God, God's creation, and all of our kin on this planetary home of ours. Today, we are fortunate enough to be able to take a deep dive into the waters of theology so that we might resurface renewed and re-energized for the work of creation justice. But before I introduce our special guest for today, Dr. Robin Henderson Espinoza, let me first turn things over to my co-host, the Reverend Michael Malcolm, pastor of Rush Memorial Church in Atlanta, executive director for Alabama Interfaith Power and Light and People's Justice Council. Help us think about this webinar for today, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Brooks, for um, the introduction, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robin, for uh, being with us today. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, as I started doing my research beyond just the social media posts for Dr. Robin Henderson Espinosa, I was inspired by two words that really stood out to me. One was intersectionality, and the other was non-binary. And I thought to myself, what is, what is my message for this justice space that I operate in? And I think that message is justice first. And this justice first is a slogan that was introduced by my mentor, Reverend Leo Woodbury. And it says that those who fight for justice should fight using intersectional analysis. In essence, pull, pulling together our expertise as an intersectional or interdisciplinary team. Uh, it's Jennifer Nordstrom who states that there is not a single experience of the environment divorced from other relationships or a single experience of humanity divorced from the environment. Rather, a variety of experiences are influenced by overarching patterns in society and they intersect with each other, humans and non-humans, nature. I mean, what would it be like for communities of faith to become non-binary and intersectional um, as it relates to our issues of justice? I believe that it would look like community. I thought that this may have been a new concept until I remembered that there was a time that there was a tension between the Apostle Paul and the Church of Corinth due to Paul's preaching versus Apollo's preaching. And, you know, Paul goes on to say, I plan Apollo's waters, but God gives the increase. But I actually like the end part of that statement that says, we are all servants of God, working together. You are God's field and God's building. I think that this particular webinar will help us to see this intersectionality and non-binary form of justice. And again, I thank you and I look forward to hearing from you, Doc. Terrific, Michael. Thank you for that framing for today's conversation. As I introduce Robin, I also invite all of you to, to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, tell us uh, where you're from, your name, your pronouns, your place of worship, get all that in the chat box so we can get to know you and see uh, the many different places where our audience comes from. Now for Dr. Robin, Dr. Robin is a rising theological star who has been named one of the 10 faith leaders to watch by the Center for American Progress with a new book entitled Activist Theology. Dr. Robin bridges the gap between academia and activism. And let me tell you that requires an extraordinary level of intellectual flexibility and versatility. Dr. Robin's new book is in the stores. I'll share a link to it. You will want to check it out after this webinar if you have not done so already. Without further ado, let me turn things over to our special guest. Go ahead, Robin. Thanks so much, y'all. It's really great to be here. And in addition to talking a little bit about the book, I want to talk about the relationship of activist theology to our other work in the world, particularly as it relates to um, our planetary concerns regarding climate change. 
you, you know, I, um, I've been on a journey these last five years after finishing the PhD. I took, I took a, a faculty post in Berkeley and, and taught there for a couple of years, but then the 2016 election happened. And for many of us, it turned our world upside down and it did for me. And I remember um, the night of the election, um, really thinking about my roots and the call to come home. I'm originally from Northern Mexico, the Republic of Texas, and I had left Texas um, for graduate school. I went to seminary in Chicago and then the PhD in Colorado and then moved further out west to what I'd be the queer utopia of the Bay Area in the San Francisco, Oakland area. And when I discovered that the Bay Area was not the place to be and it was not a place for my roots to nourish or even um, the fight that I wanted to fight, I moved home after the election and I landed in Nashville. Um, a, a dear friend of mine said to me after I finished my PhD, Robin, you just need to go hang out with real people. And, you know, coming up through academia and, and being entrenched in what I call the self-perpetuating elitism of higher education, you're not around a lot of normal people. You're around people who read and write all the time, who are having a kind of conversation that isn't understandable to the public square. And during that time, um, when I was transitioning back to the South, um, you know, I'd also years ago come out as trans and, and finally found the language of, of non-binary, um, knowing that I wanted to um, live in between the gender spectrum and then and to imagine a world that was larger than the gender binary. I kind of think that way about theology and ethics too, that there's something larger than Western thought. Um, and as we think about the work that we need to be doing that is that should be grounded in an intersectional analysis. There's something larger than um, our local context. There's really um, a world that that we need to um, that we need to partner with um, people of all of all kinds. Um, um, certainly, non-human animals. Um, so anyways, this, this language of non-binary, it, it fit me as a gender expression, but it also became a way about uh, existing in the world as a public theologian, that there wasn't, um, that there shouldn't be a demarcation between what is academy and not academy, or what is the public and not the public, that, that we all should be invested in conversation, because my hope is that the work that the Activist Theology Project is doing is the work of collective liberation. And that means coming together with radically different people, doing the work of social justice from a place of bridging. Not just bridging with the, the, the sameness that we can recognize, but really bridging from the points of radical difference. So that means racial difference, that means economic difference, that means housing difference, that means ideological difference, that means really building um, the kind of relationship that we need to have to do the work, to really save our work from the violence and destruction that empire and politics is, is creating. So um, I started writing this book and, and the book took three years to make and I often tell the story about um, how I turned in a draft of the book and they wrote back to me and they said, this is really great work, but this is not the book that we want. We want to know more about you. And so I spent a whole year rewriting the entire book from the place of story, because the previous draft was this high theory, you know, five people could understand it if, if they were reading the discourse. Um, and, and Fortress said, basically gave me the challenge to say, um, this is not it, you've not arrived. And it was a really humbling moment for me because as much as I work, as, as much as I work in the public square of translating theory to praxis, I was still very much entrenched in this academic orientation of writing and 
learning how to write for the public square and learning how to write for the church because I really believed that my vocation is for both church and world, church and society um, as a theologian. And, and so learning to write for the public square was a really, really humbling moment, and which really required me to get, to get right with myself and all that is around me. And so I just started writing my story. I started writing my story of the questions that I hold um, from being younger when my, when my white father um, employed undocumented workers on his land and really struggling with um, that reality and thinking theologically about what does it mean to employ undocumented workers and and not and and in not a living wage like like we're, we're still doing that today we're still i mean here here in in nashville the the number of immigrant workers that we have um are astounding and they're they're often not paid at all so there's a lot of wage theft but if they are paid it's not it's not a living wage for them to have a home so many of them are in shelters so they work all day for these white serving elites doing gentrification work in the city and then um they're sleeping in shelters at night because they don't have enough to to rent an apartment so I really struggled with a lot of these questions um, that came from my own life and my own context. Um, I'm born to a Mexican woman out of this country, and um, that means that I straddle the the relationship between race and power when it comes to, I heavily identify as a Mexican American, but I'm white passing. So I move in the world with power, access, and privilege. I'm also masculine of center, masculine presenting. And so how, how do I deal with these, um, these nodes of power that when not dealt with in, in right ways become very toxic? And so I wrote a book um, uh, really about my story and, and the ways that I think theology should be mobilized, which I think is through activism and through acts of justice, and primarily that theology should be mobilized through storytelling. And so um, the Activist Theology Project was born um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And it's a, it's a nonprofit based in storytelling and companionship. And we're working to tell a different story about theology and ethics. Uh, one that actually works to create conditions for social healing. And so we're really invested in healing justice on a societal level. And we believe that, that um, the discipline of theology and ethics is a place where we can talk about social healing, how we can be in right relationship with one another and in right relationship with the world and learn how to have a relationship of planetary concern with all that exists. The thing that I love about activist theology is, and, and its primary relationship to climate change and our planetary concern is that of relationality. I write about um, the kind of relationship that we should be in with one another. And it's a non-competitive relationship. What I mean by that is that we live in a world of toxic white masculinity that is killing um, certainly black trans women and other trans people. But this toxicity of power is, um, is infused in all the relationships that we have with one another. Um, it's, why, it's, why, um, it's why the white liberal progressive pe folks um, say Black Lives Matter without having an analysis of why it's important to say Black Lives Matter. You know, saying Black Lives Matter is a theological statement around a particular anthropological commitment to flesh that has been marginalized by empire. And so this is all about power and relationship. And, and when, we, when we get right in right relationship with ourselves and the world around us, we can begin to build bridges that are non-competitive and we can build the kind of relationality that we need to have to really do the work in the world that I think that we're all called to do. Um, so the Activist Theology Project is committed to that. And we primarily try to do that um, through um, different media, so through short film, through online courses, 
um, and the and and a big place that we are wanting to wanting to um, establish is the role of embodiment and the role of the body in social healing. And so, you know, I don't want folks to think that activist theology is just a thinking project or a thought project. Activist theology is about getting our hands dirty. It is about getting into the streets. It is about um, bringing people in and hosting people around the table, learning how, to, you know, it's hard to hate people over a good meal. That's what I always tell people. And so figuring out how do we share meals? How do we get back to some of the basics of this work, which is sharing meals, which is hospitality, which is being in relationship with people. And so um, I spend a lot of my time um, traveling, speaking to different groups, churches. You know, I never thought that becoming a theologian would mean that I would spend so much time in church, but I spend a lot of time in church preaching and, and a lot of accompaniment with folks, of just partnering with folks and helping them think and strategize on how to live out their vocation, which I'm deeply committed to. Um, what I love about activist theology and our project is that um, we're committed to building the discourse. I think a lot of times when, when we see a new sort of theme come out of the academy, the discourse is built from an insular place of self-perpetuating elitism. And what I'm trying to do is, is build the discourse from, a, from, from the place of multiplicity. So for example, on our podcast, the Activist Theology podcast, we're gonna have multiple voices on that podcast to help build the discourse. Because if, if, you, if you build it, if, if, if I just try to build it on my own, then that's the danger of a single narrative. And we all know the danger of a single narrative capitulates to a type of power and toxicity that doesn't create conditions for social healing or collective liberation. And so activist theology really is a, a multi-node project that is working across lines of radical difference to really build the kind of world that we want to see. And we believe that takes a multiplicity of persons, that we believe that takes community. Um, we're not trying to do it on our own. I'm not trying to do it on my own. I mean, I, 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 at festivals, for example, I will never give a talk on my own. I always do a talk with someone else because I believe the conversation piece of doing, of having a conversation partner or having a co-presenter is about displacing the power that is often erected to put someone on a pedestal. And so I try my best to do collaboration as often as I can and as frequently as I can because it disrupts that, um, not only celebrity culture, but it disrupts the myth of the single narrative or the danger of the single narrative. And it privileges collaboration, which is the final thing that I'll say about the Activist Theology Project. And really the book that was written is that our project is a, is a deeply collaborative project. We try to be as flat as possible in terms of, we really wanna be driven by consensus and togetherness. And we believe that if we can model the kind of work that we're trying to achieve in the world, just in our leadership with one another and our, and our core team, then we can actually build the kind of world that we want to see. And so um, I think what that means is togetherness or what I grew up hearing, which is somos en conjunto, which is we are together. We don't know how to actually be together in this fight. Um, we all have opinions. Um, we all are either silenced or canceled by one another. We actually don't know how to be together in the fight for social change, for, for social healing, for collective liberation. And so the Activist Theology Project as a core team, we are deeply committed to togetherness and a kind of togetherness that we really believe will, will shape the work and, and shape how we do the work through relationship. And so I think that that's what I'll say in terms of um, the Activist Theology Project. I, I certainly welcome comments and questions and ideas. And certainly if you wanna be interested in the work that we're doing, you can sign up for our email list. We have a podcast that um, we're, we're actually launching. We were doing 60 seconds of activism for a while, 
but we we think that um, having more conversation instead of just 60 seconds um, is a better way to go. So we're relaunching our podcast, um, and there's a there's a teaser trailer out right now. The first episode drops on Thursday. Our friends Delta Ray have given us um, their song "Hands Dirty." for us to use as part of the podcast because we really want the work to be around getting our hands dirty with one another and with the world so that we can see the kind of world that, that we want to um, inhabit. So I think I'll, I think I'll stop there. That's a lot of me talking and would love to, um, would love to hear folks questions or if Brooks or Michael, if you have questions or want me to clarify for your community, I'm happy to do that. Um, and then basically, I just want to be in conversation with y'all because I believe the 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 more time we can have together, the better world that we can build. And so you can see you can sort of see in my pedagogical approach that togetherness is the way that that I that I want to run with this. So I think I'll stop there and and I'll I'll, I'll go for questions. Great, thank you for that. Uh, if you want to ask a question of Robin, you can type it into the Q&A box and we'll be able to see it there or you can raise your hand. And um, I've also got a question I'm going to find here in a second that was emailed to me. Michael, do you have any starters that you'd like to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Robin, again, I did have an opportunity to uh, do some research uh, prior to, just because I'm a fan. Yeah. Uh, but in my research, uh, and you've expressed this term community, uh, could you explain to us what community looks like for you? Yeah, so I think about community from the place of the politics of radical difference. That community, um, certainly I think we, we can see iterations of community where we all look alike. Maybe we have the same skin color or we have the same educational background. But really when I'm thinking about community, I'm thinking about a community of radical difference, which means we may not all look the same. We may, we may not all um, live in the same neighborhood. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's a term, you know, it comes from the Latin being in union with one another. And so when I think about community, how do, we, how do we build the kind of relationship where we're in deep solidarity with one another? And my co-host on the podcast, we talk about um, community and solidarity and kinship with one another. And, and when, when we as an organization talk about community and a community that is comprised of uh, labors for social healing, we are not talking about folks who look or sound the same. We are really looking at, um, you know, agents, humans, non non humans, coming together to be in deep solidarity. And so, and I think that, um, you know, because we live in a world where we are all radically interconnected, both with human creatures, non human creatures, and the world that community has to look like, um, how do we not chop down every tree when we decide to gentrify a neighborhood? Because yeah. we actually need nature in order to survive. So how do we be in deep communion, in union, in deep solidarity with, with nature? And so I, I sort of have a, um, I'm a, I'm a utopian thinker. And so I, I think sort of grand scale, and, and I may never see it in my lifetime. I may never see this achieved in my lifetime, but it, I believe in living my politics, because if we don't live our politics, then we're actually not being ethical agents in the world. And so community for me is um, the politics of radical difference. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I tend to have those same uh, ideas, and I, I think I'm a utopian thinker as well. Uh, and tend to move in those in that vein. Uh, you spoke a lot about being anti. Uh, you talked about being anti-patriarchy, anti-racist, uh, even anti-colonialism. Uh, could you explain those terms and and help us to, uh, in particular, because if 
I, I can't see the audience, but if I know the audience that that usually shows up in this space is predominantly white uh, yeah. audience, uh, and and it's mainly clergy. How do we yeah. uh, be anti when it comes down to our preaching and teaching um, that helps move the masses that we actually influence? Yeah, that's a great question because. And, and there's lots of terms being tossed around, you know, how do you be um, multiracial or how do you be anti-racist or how do you be um, anti-white nationalist or how do you be, how do you privilege abolition, you know, how do you be decolonial or anti-colonial? Um, all of these terms um, are important, I want to say. Language is important. And what I mean when I talk about being anti-racist is when we talk about race, it's assumed, it's been normalized that we're talking about white people. And so becoming anti-racist is a way of um, divesting from that kind of thinking and disrupting the norms. Um, the same with anti-colonial. We, we live in an age of empire where the United States continues to expand in imperial ways. That's not the ways of Jesus. Um, Jesus fought empire. He outfoxed the empire um, and then was crucified by the empire. And so be, being anti-empire or anti-colonial is, I believe, in line with the Christian tradition. And, and we, need to, we need to be real about our tradition our tradition had crusades that were colonial in nature. And that's, that's part of our lineage as Christians. Um, but I like to look at the stories collected about Jesus and, and what did we learn how to be or who, what kind of person did we learn how to be from, from the perspective of, of Jesus. Um, and, and so that informs my language and my orientation of being anti-colonial. Um, I do read a lot of folks like decolonial thought. So from, from, the, from the perspective of people of color who are, who maybe um, have been um, marginalized because of colonial activity. And I think that we need to be invested in authors of color who write from a perspective that is different from ours. Um, and so I, um, I look for language that helps create the relationship between becoming and being. We're socialized to be colonial, but how can we become anti-colonial? Right. Okay. All right, we've got a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, Susan Hendershot in the uh, chat box says, Adrian Marie Brown in her book, Emergent Strategy, talks about how those who work for justice are often busy throwing others working for justice under the bus, calling them out in public for mistakes, building a case for why people should listen to me and not them. I like your approach on the fallacy of the single narrative. Can you say more about how that approach can move us past the internal injustices that the justice movement perpetuates on itself. Yeah, you know, um, the justice movement is just as guilty of supremacy culture as what it fights, um, fights against. And I love the work of Adrienne Marie Brown and her sister Autumn Brown. And um, I think that there, there are a lot of people who um, do exactly that, throw people under the bus. And, you know, I think that what I try to do is I try to be, I, I get really great invitations like this one right here to talk about my work. But what interests me um, is not just talking about me and, and uh, in like putting myself up, but really talking about the kind of work that we can do together um, because I'm not interested in capitulating to celebrity culture. Um, 
and then your, to your question about, can I say more about how that approach can move us past the internal injustices that the justice movement perpetuates it's on itself? Yeah, we need to learn how to be in relationship with one another. And I think that, you know, we, we live in a culture and a, and a justice environment where people, um, they think they have an idea, they have an idea, they say, well, I'm gonna start an organization. The last thing I wanted to do was start um, a collaborative project, um, but, but I was only willing to do it if I was in deep community, deep conversation with other people. And it's actually being in conversation and relationship with white folks who are deeply invested in creating a different world is is only why I, I'm willing to do it. And so I think what the justice community could be doing is not only reading things like Adrian Marie Brown and listening to their podcast, but also learning to be in relationship across lines of radical difference. That actually might help us move to a different place in our work. It's why we, we at the Activist Theology Project are like, you want to come do work with us? Let's do it. Let's figure out how to, how to make it happen. And, and we'll, we'll do everything we can to, to collaborate because we really believe that collaboration and, and having a collective orientation will be the kind of work that we need to do. Um, Jeffrey Spencer asked, uh, well, he said, anti-racism uh, Ibram Kendi's books, especially How to Be Anti-Racist, are very influential for him. Uh, any thoughts about his approach to being anti-racist? That is a great book. Um, I really like um, that, that human. He's amazing. And um, we should be reading as much anti-racist work as we can. It takes a diversity of tactics. Everybody is going to have a different approach, a different pedagogical approach, different ideological approach. Um, I like how Ibram does it. Um, I think that we should be reading more of, of that kind of work. And, and we should be learning how even we got to the place where we have to read about anti-racism. We, we, need to, we need to have a historical memory. Um, for example, why, why is capitalism the way it is? Well, it's because they wouldn't abolish the economic system during the times of slavery and enslavement. That, that's why we are here where we are. So we, we, see, we don't have a historical memory in this country on why the disenfranchised are how they are and why there's such economic disparity. And so if we can do, if we can do the work of the historical memory and actually help people understand why we got to where we are, which is what activist theology is trying to help folks do through storytelling, um, then we will have, we will understand why we need to read all the anti-racism work th that is available to us. Right. We've got another question here uh, from Laura. I'm so grateful to be hearing from and talking with Robin. My question, is this the church, especially the UCC, but many others is a place, is in a place of sameness. We gather with folks who share similar theologies to participate in rituals that are similar year to year with folks who are mostly the same in race, ethnicity, gender, identity, age, economic class, and all the time you are spending in churches, how are you talking about gathering across radical differences in these church spaces that are so homogeneous? And or can you say more about your ideas for action for decolonizing the white church? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's probably a lot. It's probably a question and we don't have the time to, <laughs> to strategize, <laughs> but it's the kind of question that we need to be asking because so many of our communities look like one another and so many of our communities um, act like one another. We, we, need to, we need to get very real on the power of socialization and the power of white socialization. The reason why we have white churches and, and the white liberal church is because um, in, in part, um, when people of color moved into cities, white folks left the city for the suburbs and began building segregated communities. White folks didn't wanna be in relationship with people of color. And so, um, we have to get, again, historical memory. We have to get real serious on, 
how cities came to be and how suburbs came to be um, and the role of economic supremacy in that and the role of all the isms that that plague us um, I'm in churches a lot and and the churches that I'm in are mostly white liberal progressive churches I grew up evangelical and still very um, still I still have an affinity for the evangelical tradition I think they've um, got something um, in terms of how to be in community with one another the white liberal progressive church um, has created a very insular community and and you know it's going to take a lot to break down those walls and decolonize that kind of church but it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna have to be i think um helping people feel called to action and i think a lot of people within the white liberal progressive community don't feel called to action they feel very comfortable in their pews or in their chairs that they're sitting in on each sunday and they'll give um, maybe to an organization, but there's no embodied action to their theology, which is why I talk about if we want to be church in the world, we need to live our politics. I don't care what you believe. What I care about is how you act in the world, where you buy your groceries, how you treat the people who are begging for money on the streets. Are you volunteering your time to cook meals? I mean, it, it really is going to take all of us doing embodied action to build the kind of world that decolonizes and disrupts the homogeneity that is quite serving. Robin, I'm going to break a little bit from um, reading off the other uh, questions and ask a personal question. You, you spoke about storytelling and I know in seminary I, taught, I was taught about storytelling from the aspect of uh given a sermon but tell me how is it an, is it an effective tool in the work that you do as so, an activist theologian yeah so it's a great question um i think a lot of us are disconnected from our own stories we um read the news we watch the 24-hour news cycle on cnn or M msnbc and we actually don't know our own story and I think one of the most powerful things that we can be doing as a community of justice-minded people is getting to know our own stories and actually um, finding out where in our stories are we capitulating to supremacy culture and how do actually we re-narrate or restory ourselves so that we are in right relationship with one another and the world. Um, so it's about getting to know yourself on a on a on a on a real deep level and, and so, that, it, so is it the stories that you're telling yourself or the stories that you're hearing from others so it's both right because we want to build empathy and okay. and we want to we want to build empathy to try to change the world to try to change our communities and and getting to know ourselves through listening and telling stories Hmm. Is great theological work. Okay. Got a question from Wiley Cook. As someone who is in seminary being indoctrinated with communicating in academic theory, how does one actively learn to translate this high theory into language of the people? Or perhaps is that the issue? Do we just need to start with the people, like Latin American liberation theology? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's hard for me to answer that question because I, I have three degrees in theology and so I, I've read the tradition and I've read the canon and I've read continental philosophy and I'm trained as a philosophical theologian. And so um, I have read all that and love, and I mean, I love, I love to read high theory, but you are right that not everyone knows how to translate. Um, and I'll say that as a person who speaks both Spanish and English and who has, is often living in between two languages, you know, I, a lot of times I feel lost in translation when, I, when I'm talking with people because something I may convey in Spanish is not 
available in, in English. And so, you know, I grew up translating and, and learning to translate theory to action or theory to or theology to praxis is something that came because I was living in between Spanish and English. Um, and so I would say certainly that starting with the people is great. Um, and the academy is self-perpetuating elitism. In, in, in a lot of ways, the academy doesn't care about the people. And I say that that way. Um, and so frankly, um, because I've been in the academy and I still exist in the academy, um, the academy is not concerned with the public square. And so the work of activist theology is, is um, super concerned with the public square and with the people. If my work doesn't translate to the people, then I've got to rewrite it. I've got to redo it. And so that's why I think the power of story um, and empathy and restoring ourselves is the work that we need to be doing in our justice work. And I just, I just want to say um, to the person who asked that question, um, you know, seminary serves a particular function for credentialing. And I'm a non-institutional person as much as I can be. And I've also been credentialed by the academy. And it's, and it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's learning to straddle the borderlands and, and learning, um, learning when to pick your fight with the institution. And I'd be happy to talk offline about that if that person wants to reach out to me. Uh, Peter Saltel asks, how does a community of radical difference shape the work that needs to be done for climate justice? Yeah, so um, what's really great about building community of radical difference is its non-competitive nature. We need to remember that nature and the environment is at root non-competitive. It's going to happen whether or not we like it or not. And so we can learn a lot um, from the environment and from nature on how to be with one another. And so I would say that a core value of a community of radical difference is non-competitive and, and, that it sh and that's a value that is shared with the environment and climate justice. I think the other thing that a community of radical difference, a core value, is um, learning to pay attention to that which has been marginalized. I think that when we come, uh, when we come together across lines of difference, we, we actually learn to listen better to one another. And we can learn to listen to um, how we're harming our earth and our land. And, and, you know, and we all have examples on how that is being done. I can look at my window right now and see 12 cranes in, in Nashville and the, the pollution of all the construction and the displacement of land and the harming of land. Um, that's not the kind of relationship I think that we need to be in um, with one another or with the environment. And so I would say that there are two core values. One is, um, the non-competitive relationality, and the second is an active listening and a deep listening. Um, we actually learn that when we're in a community of ra comprised of radical difference committed to climate change, climate justice. Robert, I wonder if you can help us paint out the picture of, of what you envision in that, you know, let's say we're, we're working on relationships, we're sharing meals together, we're working on collaboration. How do we get then from there to a world beyond empire, realizing that, you know, empire is what props up this destruction of the earth and drives climate change and so forth. Yeah. How do, how do, we, how do we make that? Well, I mean, I think we need imagination and we don't talk enough about imagination. Um, do we have the capacity to imagine the kind of world we want? Because it, it's gonna, you know, I, I work with four people at the Activist Theology Project. It's gonna take more than four of us to build the kind of world. It's gonna, it's gonna take me working and us working together to build the kind of world. But if we don't have an, an imagination of what that looks like, then we're just gonna be spinning our wheels. And, 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 and I think that part of the world that we want to create is where hospitality is valued, which is why I think sharing meals together is important. 
I think part of the world that we want to live at live in is where poverty is eradicated and everyone has a home. So we need to talk about economic justice and we need to talk about how gentrification is displacing people. I, I read an article uh, about Nashville. It costs eighty thousand dollars a year to live in Nashville, when most people only make fifty grand. So that means I, I'm not I'm not a math major or anything. I'm a theologian. I'm one trick pony, but there seems to be a deficit there of like 30 grand. So we need to come together with economic justice, with, with city planning and with folks to imagine the kind of world. And if we start local, we can grow bigger. And if, and if we can figure out how to um, create these pods of conversations um, in our local communities, we can build this net, this network that is bridged together. And that's how we build a community of radical difference. That's how we imagine a different world. That's how we achieve uh, moving beyond the empire. What uh, suggestions do you have for those of us living and working across faith traditions in communities where non-Christians are a substantial population? And that came from Joy Barnett's. That's a great question. Um, the work of activist theology is, um, you know, I try very hard not to come out as a Christian because Christianity equals white supremacy right now. And, and I, I work very hard to um, work with my Muslim siblings with, and those siblings who have different orientations, certainly no faith or, or atheist and, and agnostic. I, I think what a, one of the most truest positions that I've had in my life is that of agnosticism that I don't really know. Um, and I think that um, that is our work to, to build together across these lines of radical difference. Um, and I think that when we can figure out how to put our beliefs aside and our ideology aside and just rely on the politics and how we are living in the world, there's, there's something wonderful that happens when we live our politics because we, we come into contact with people who are radically different than us, who maybe have different beliefs, but who are willing to join a fight because it matters to them. And so um, I, I would encourage folks to, to, to put aside belief systems and really ask folks, really have folks ask themselves, what are my politics? And, and, and do I share the same politics with my Muslim siblings or with my Buddhist brothers and sisters? And if I do, then let's join together in this fight to build a better world. I think that goes back to you um, and that, that term you use about being non-binary. Right. Um, and, and us being binary, non-binary in our justice and our yeah. compassion. It's a both and, and, and. it's gotta be a community. both end. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Robin, you, you began your comments today by talking about the uh, catalytic effect that the, the uh, Trump election had on you. Yeah. And so I was just at a meeting uh, the other night where the, the, begin, the speaker began by saying, all right, it's 2020, that means it's go time. <laughs> We've got an election coming up this year. Uh, so, I mean, what are, what are you seeing and thinking you know, in this election year, uh, for people who are, you know, concerned about the fate of our planet, who are mm -hmm. concerned about the critical time that we live in as far as climate goes, um, you know, climate justice, uh, the critical issues faced, and the immense importance that this upcoming election has on so many different justice fronts. And so what, what are you feeling and thinking right now on, on that? Um, a lot, because all the campaigns are reaching out to me for my endorsement. Um, and I think that we need to be very clear that um, we still live in a, live in a patriarchal world. And, um, you know, I, I think about the sexism and misogyny that Elizabeth Warren is fighting against. And, you know, I think quite honestly, um, we should all throw our cards toward Warren because she's fighting a fight against um, sexism, patriarchy, and misogyny. And, and 
and we should be good feminists and be looking at what she's doing. I also think it takes a diversity of tactics that we can't re we can't rely on um, the president to fix our problems because we know that that's not how our system works. And so we need to be talking to our local state legislators. We need to talk to, to our to our federal and the national folks. Um, and and we need to be talking to the communities that are most impacted by by the concerns that we have. Um, you know, if if we can if we can figure out how to get, um, you know, the carbon number to a to a place that that is manageable. You know, I just I feel so concerned about our world, um, and we're so focused on the presidential election that I think we're losing sight of some on the ground work that we need to be doing. And so, you know, I have opinions about all the candidates and. I think that um, the last thing we need is an old white man in office, you know, um, and also I, I don't want another four years of Trump, you know, so it's complicated. Um, I feel really sad that um, with the exception of Andrew Yang, the people of color have suspended their campaigns. Um, that tells us something about the electability and our orientation to candidates of color, we still have a race problem in this country um, that is fueling um, climate change. Um, and, and when we get down to it, our planetary concerns um, all comes down to capitalism. Um, and capitalism fuels racism and you know, we need to get serious on on supremacy culture, which which is why part of our work at the Activist Theology Project is launching curriculum on composting supremacy culture and helping people think through supremacy culture and, and get free and and think differently so they can live their politics. So I have a lot of opinions about the presidential campaign and also we you know, November twenty twenty, there's a lot that needs to happen before November twenty twenty which means we need to build coalitions. We need to be deeply intersectional. We need to continue to fight. Um, we can't rely on casting a vote in November, 2020 um, for, for us to get free. Uh, that's just not how this works. And so um, we've got to continue to build the beloved community as often as we can and as frequent as we can through things like this on conversation and storytelling and sharing insight. Thank you. Michael, do you have any further questions uh, before we roll into uh, calls to action and, and what we can do from, from here? Well, actually, you know what, Brooks, I was thinking um, I'm going to turn my call to action segment over back over to Robin because I'd like to hear uh, from Dr. Robin what could we do as a community of faith to help further your work and, and the work of this um, uh, radical difference yeah. um, in relation to uh, our fight for environmental justice? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I love that question. And I think that, and I've already reached out to you, you know, on email, basically, how do we build how do we build the the kind of network that is going to help establish the kind of society i mean that's social healing um how do we build the the necessary relationships to do the work um and so certainly i would love to hear from as many people who want to get on board with the work that we're doing but you have to understand that the work that we're doing is the work of deep collaboration and and collective um, with, with with folks that be like us, and we but um, kind of world that, that that's my call to action is we would love for you to join. Us, but joining us means um, being a, a cop of folks 
um, and and we're rooted in the South. And so I believe the South has the greatest political potential for change if we really harness the nation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Robin. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that in a, a couple of ways just to say that uh, our next webinar, we will have some folks from the South because we're going to be focusing on the most toxic places in the United States, whether it's Cancer Alley, whether it's Houston, whether it's Port Arthur. When you talk about toxic places in the United States, you're often talking about places that are in the South, places that have been called ground zero for the climate justice movement. And so, but that's what we'll be focused on in our next webinar. We're still putting together the pieces for that. So uh, our audience should stay tuned for that. Um, and, the, and the other uh, call to action, I'm gonna echo uh, Michael and I are part of the UCC Council for Climate Justice. They've come out with a Kairos call to action. Uh, digs into some liberation theology from South Africa and the United States and, and, and puts that together and discerning what we need to be doing right now when it comes to addressing climate and inequality in the United States. So, so I'll put a, a link into that, just a, an opportunity for further theological reflection and discernment uh, for everybody out there. Any, any closing words, Michael or Robin, that you'd like to add to the conversation? As I, I say every webinar, I'll say again, whatever you do, get involved. Uh, you don't come to these webinars just to listen. I believe you're called, you, you come to be encouraged to uh, act. And so get involved. Remember what has been talked about today and that radical difference. Um, and, and make sure that we are uh, intentional about manifesting that. Thank you all for joining us. Rob, uh, Dr. Rob. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that I would add is I would love to hear from folks, and I agree with with um, with Michael that that you're here to to get involved, and so let's figure out how to get our hands dirty together and build the kind of world that we want to to inhabit. Well, thank you, Dr. Robin. Applause all the way around for you today and your generosity you. in joining us. Uh, great to be in conversation with you and to hear your message encouraging us to work together collaboratively and and with a spirit of hospitality and so uh, a much needed message much appreciated and uh, we're glad that uh, to be able to share this with our audience thanks again everyone thanks so much